Thank you for that uplifting reading. <laughs> now you may wonder why we're reading from chapter 6 when we're going to uh, be studying in chapter 7, but I've been uh, gone for I think three weeks uh, and so I just wanted to refresh your memory because remember, uh, well in the whole Bible it's, it's important, but it's especially important in Revelation that you read things in context. If you read things in isolation, uh, you're, you're probably going to go awry a little bit and we don't want to do that. Uh, so we have to look at chapter 7 in context with chapter 6. And chapter 6 ends with that question, who can stand? It's kind of a hopeless uh, situation. So even before we go there, I want us to go uh, clear back uh, to chapter 1 and revisit the purpose of the book of Revelation. We've talked about that a lot. And we know that the, the purpose of the book isn't to come up with a whole bunch of weird, strange things that are going to happen someday down the road. Uh, we've pretty well established that. And uh, we've got the purpose laid out for us very succinctly in the very first verse of the very first chapter, and it is this. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave John to show to his servants the things that must, what? Soon take place. Not thousands of years down the road, but must soon take place. And then you look down at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who sent me. So the purpose of Revelation is to reveal the person of Jesus Christ to us in order that we might enjoy peace. Now, if we don't get who Jesus is, if we don't have him as our Lord and Savior, there's no way we're going to be able to experience peace in our hearts because this world is simply too chaotic. So that's the purpose of the book. But now it's interesting, as John is writing these words, he, along uh, with many of his fellow Christians, was experiencing the hard reality of Jesus' words that he spoke back in the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, the 33rd verse, which is, in this world you will have peace. It's not right, is it? No, you guys know better now. What did he say? He said, in this world you will have, this is another uplifting portion of scripture, tribulation. So, we have John here telling us that Christ is revealing himself to us in order that we might have peace, but then we have Christ himself telling us, as long as we're in this world, we are going to have tribulation. And, as you know, we, we looked at the situation in the seven churches, and they were indeed experiencing a lot of great tribulation. And if we look around the world, it's hard for us to grasp, because we have been so blessed to, to live in this country, and, and where, you know, we don't really suffer persecution or tribulation in the sense that so many around the world do, and so many throughout history have. So, so we tend to think that this is somewhere else. And, and it's also interesting to me that that, that the, the, the theological structure that uh, came up with this idea that this book is about something that's going to happen down the road somewhere was really, it, it originated in the UK uh, with the Plymouth Brethren uh, just before the turn of the 20th century, the 19th century. Uh, but it was really popularized right here in the good old USA. Uh, a guy by the name of Dr. C.I. Schofield uh, was very instrumental in popularizing it because he came up with the Schofield Bible, which is uh, usually a King James edition, which is fine. Uh, but his footnotes really pushed this proposition that Revelation is all about something that's going to happen someday. Before that, uh, the majority report of the church did not buy into that. So here we've got these two things. We have, on the one hand, the promise of peace. On the other hand, we have the promise of tribulation. And are we now becoming accustomed to these sorts of things as we go through this book? Remember, we have the lamb who is the lion. Pretty contradictory there, isn't it? A little incongruent. And, and now we have peace and tribulation at the same time. 
what's going on? Which is it? Is it peace or is it tribulation? I want to know. I don't like ambiguity. I'm a good Western linear thinker. I want things settled. I want them all in my little box so I can stack up over here in my other little boxes. God doesn't operate that way, does he? And so, we have to deal with these issues. John asked the question, who can stand when confronted by the great living God? Have you ever been in a situation, and I'm sure you have, that just simply seemed hopeless? As you thought about the problem, the issue, as you look down the, the tunnel of time, so to speak, the, the further out you looked, it just seemed like the worse it was going to get. And no matter what you did, you couldn't fix it. Well, that's where John is. He's seen all this. Remember now, in, in chapter uh, 6 there, we had the six seals, right? And they were open consecutively. There are seven. But you remember that chapter 7 here is a hiatus. The seventh seal will be opened in, in chapter 8. And John looks at the situation that God has uh, given him and he says, it's hopeless. Who can stand in this situation? And you've been there. I've been there sometimes. Who will be able to stand before God's righteous judgment. That's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Is his judgment on, on the earth. Who will be able to stand? You know, Paul asked the same question in Romans chapter 7, which is probably should be my life's verse. And uh, or verses, as the case may be. Let me let me read those for you so I get them here just right. Chapter seven, verse twenty-one. Now this is the apostle Paul. He knows what he's talking about, right? He's no armchair theologian. He's the man. After Jesus, Paul's the man. And so here's what the man says. He says, "So I find it to be a law, a law, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand." For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Don't we all? But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? There's Paul, it's hopeless. You know, and he, he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those I do. You've been there. I've been there all too often. And I come to the conclusion that Paul comes to. Oh, wretched man that I am. What's wrong with me? How am I ever going to get out of this mess? Well, God answers Paul's question. Chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in, there's the key, in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? That's huge. That's fantastic. So, oh wretched men and women that we are, hopeless basket cases in the spiritual sense, what hope do we have? We have Jesus. We have the hope of heaven, which is what I titled this message, and we will get there. Only Jesus, only those who look to Christ will be able to stand. And so it is with John as he asks Paul's question in the corporate sense, who can stand? When we think about our spiritual condition before we came to faith in Christ, we have a little better appreciation for it. And again, we can look to Paul. He lays it out for us. And good old Paul, he, he never mints his words. you, you got to like that about him. And he lays it out here in Ephesians chapter 2. Start here with verse 1. And you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, you don't have to be a theologian to understand that language, do you? You are dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what can a dead person do to better their condition? Nothing. They're dead. 
That was our spiritual condition before Christ invaded our space. We were dead, we were hopeless, we were wretched, we were whatever you want to, what, however you want to describe it. I, I remember the King James, I like that, when he's ta they're talking about Lazarus. And uh, she says to Jesus, oh, don't open the tomb because he stinketh. Well, so did you. And so did I. And he goes on, we're dead in our sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now that's not there, I'm just adding that. But that's what Paul's saying. That was our condition. Pretty bad. Pretty bad indeed. So there we are. So, what do we do? Now some of us, in that spiritually dead condition, did try. There are spiritually dead people that do good things on this earth. They do good works. You, you can be a non-Christian and be a, a wealthy individual and build a wing on a hospital and that's a good thing. But it has no spiritual significance. And Isaiah points it out to us, doesn't he? In, in Isaiah 64, he says, All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. So we try. We try to do good things. But spiritually we're dead, so they don't count. If we are spiritually dead, even the good things we do count for nothing. What hope is there? I hope you've been spiritually uplifted so far. If the good things we do aren't any good, if we're dead, if no one can stand, if even Paul can't pull off living this Christian life as he knows he should, how do we have any hope of doing it? Pretty bleak. Well, Ephesians gives us the answer. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. There's the answer. The answer is grace through Christ. That's how, how we can stand. There's an old hymn, and I don't remember the author, but uh, the... Uh, the, what, the, the refrain, the chorus, whatever you call that part you repeat all the time. I, I'm a musical expert, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it goes like this. It's grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is able to cleanse from sin. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all, all our sin. It's like having the ace of trump if you're a pinochle player. You know, the ace of trump beats everything. No matter what anybody else plays, if you can play the ace of trump, you take the trick. And that's the way grace is when it comes to sin. No matter how bad we muck it up, no matter how long we wallow in our pit, God trumps all that with his grace. And he says, I lift you up out of there. And I'm going to keep you now. That's our hope. At the end of chapter 6, John certainly needs a glimpse of God's grace, don't you think? Chapter 6 is pretty, pretty bad. You know, this is a common thing throughout the, Old, or throughout the Bible. You look at the Old Testament. And you have Moses. You know? Now here he's, he's led the people out of, out of Egypt. And what's the first thing that happens to him? Does he experience peace and calm? Tranquility in his life? Heck no. The Egyptians are coming. They're going to kill him. He experiences tribulation. There's no way out. There's no way. He's caught between the Red Sea and the Egyptians. 
but God. That's always a great phrase when you see that phrase in the Bible. But God parted the Red Sea, didn't he? Sure he did. Mm -hmm. By grace. Uh, David, you know, David spends all this time running from Saul and all that and, and for no reason really other than Saul just didn't like him. And Saul should have been able to easily take David out. But by God's grace, he was delivered. Isaiah, you remember when Isaiah got a glimpse of God, he thought he was done for. Remember? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I'm going to die. There's no hope. And then Elijah, he's a classic one. You want to preach a sermon on uh, suicide. You know, he certainly wanted to do himself in. He said, you know, just, I'm just done. There's no hope. And then God showed him there was hope. A common thread throughout the Bible. So now, John is at the end of his rope. And God says, whoa, stop the show. We're going to take a time out, and I'm going to show you, John, who can stand. Now, it's interesting to me that in our story, as we've been going through it, John never tells the people that they aren't going to struggle. And I, it was put very well, as I was reading this book just the other day, this is the advantage of going to conferences and things. You're introduced to people that you didn't really know before. And this is a new, new author for me. Grim Goldsworthy. He's been around a long time. He's an Australian guy. And uh, over at our elder retreat, it was one of the books that our, our speaker recommended, and I picked it up, and I'm glad I did. If you want to get something that's really good, uh, this is the Goldsworthy Trilogy. And you can get it off Amazon for, I don't know, not too much, 12, 15 bucks. Here's what uh, he says. He says, John does not urge his fellow Christians to seek a means of escape from tribulation. Interesting. Because what's the first thing we want to do when we're experiencing tribulation? <laughs> yeah, right. I want to get out of this thing. I don't like it. He, John doesn't tell his people to do that. For he understood only too well that discipleship means suffering. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. If you've never read that, it's a classic. It's a wonderful book. Uh, Bonhoeffer was a huge individual who, by the way, was hung just a, a few days before the World War II was over. And I love this quote. Uh, <clears throat> as he was ascending the gallows, he said, For me, this is the end, the beginning of life. That's, that's huge. And that's the way it will be for us. That's why we can talk about, in the book of Revelation, these martyrs and that they overcame. And that's exactly what Bonhoeffer was doing. He was overcoming as he went to those gallows. To, to the non-Christian, they would say, well, he lost. He lost his life, right in the prime of his life. No. He knew. He won. He stepped into glory. Only too well that discipleship means suffering. Rather, he urges them to persevere to the end and so to receive the blessings prepared for them. Isn't that interesting? John never tells them to flee tribulation, but to persevere, to hang in there. But God, but God breaks in. Let's look here now at chapter 7. Let me read the first eight verses for you. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then he lists the tribes. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all 
all tribes and people and languages. A divine interlude now takes place as God's going to show John who can stand. You see what John and we need is reassurance that God has it all in hand. We talk a good message. I'm a sovereignty of God guy. You know, I was a Calvinist when Calvin wasn't cool. But I don't always live like it. Because when I'm suffering tribulation, when things aren't going my way, I get to scurrying around and, you know, somebody said, why pray when you can fret and worry? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I've told you guys, the hardest part about preaching is just practicing what you preach. Yeah. It's tough. It's easy to tell you guys how to do it. That's cool. A little tougher to do it myself sometimes. But uh, old Bill Holbert, he got me a little calendar for Christmas. And it's got a little saying each day, and, and it was interesting. March uh, 1st and 2nd, here it is, and the little saying is, Sleep peacefully. God is awake. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. Sleep peacefully. God is awake. Which reminds me, as I was studying for this message, there's a guy over at Western Seminary, Art Arzurdia, and he's a, he's a fantastic preacher. So here, a while back, I don't know, a few years ago, whatever it was, he preached a series on, on a book of Revelation. So I thought, well, you can get it on the internet. If you want to get the, the story straight after listening to me convoluted all, you can go to the internet and hear Art. But uh, anyway, I thought, well, I'm going to go see what Art said about this passage. And so I get there, and the first thing I, I notice is, now we're going through chapter 7 today. Art preached seven messages on chapter 7. So it took him a little while longer. But uh, one thing he said at the beginning of his message was he was talking about when he was a kid and the first prayer he learned, and the reason it tweaked my interest is because it was also the first prayer I learned, and both of us used to say it uh, every night. And it, it's a very simple little thing, but it's full of theological truth. And, it, you know, it's now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's all we need to know. There you go. Sleep peacefully. God's awake. And he'll do exactly that. If you die before you wake, he'll take you. Marvelous. Wonderful. Anyway, God redirects John's attention to heaven. See, that's our problem. We get so focused on what's going on here on earth, we forget what's happening in heaven. And one of the things Art mentioned in his message was, how many messages have you ever heard on heaven? Not very many, really. We hear a lot of messages on how to cope in various situations here on earth, but we aren't told about our hope in heaven because that's where it's at. It's never going to go right here on earth. There was a thing happened called the fall, and it messed, it turned everything on its head. So we need to be redirected to heaven. You see, what we see is not everything. We don't see what's going on in heaven. God is telling John, it's okay. I've got it all in hand. And one of the first things he points out is that he's, he's delaying this judgment, this final judgment on the earth. And that's what we see with him having the, the angels there and, and staying their hand, telling them not to, not to do anything, not to do anything yet. You see, Jesus, you'll remember, in the Gospel of John, said that all that the Father gives me will come to me. And that final judgment isn't going to come to pass until all that the Father has given him comes to him. Okay. Now there's, an, there's a finite number and I have no idea what it is and there's no point trying to figure it out but God's got it all in hand. And when that time comes who will be able to stand? Those who have been sealed with the name of the living God.
We see these 144,000 that are sealed. We see the tribes of Judah. Now it's very tempting to say, okay, well that's, that's Israel and then the church is over here and this is over there. But no, remember we're, we're using apocalyptic language here. The 144 is a number that represents a whole. And if you look carefully, and if you really want to do a study on this, it's, it's pretty interesting. And if you get Dennis Johnson's commentary on the book of Revelation, he has a great chart in there that's very helpful. But if you look at these tribes that are listed here, there's something very wrong with this list compared to the list you find in Genesis. And one of the first things you'll notice that's wrong is who's number one in the book of Genesis? The firstborn, right? Always the firstborn. You, you've been around the Bible long enough to know that that's a very uh, valued position and you don't mess with it. And the firstborn was Reuben. So when you look in Genesis, you find them the tribes listed. Reuben, always number one. Who do we have number one here? Judah. Oh, something's changed. What's happened? Why is Judah now number one? The lion of the tribe of Judah. You see, Judah's number one now because of Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of other things you'll see there that are different than they are. You, you notice Dan isn't there at all. The tribe of Dan is replaced by Manasseh. And, and we could go on and on about what all that means, but just suffice it to say, it's not the original 12 tribes that it sometimes tried to be made out to be. Remember, this is a symbolic number. And later on in chapter 13, we will see Satan's counterfeit of the seal. We are sealed. Now Satan's going to come up with a counterfeit. And what do we call that counterfeit? The mark of the beast, which strikes fear into everybody's heart. Well, not to worry. You don't have to worry about it. I'll explain it when we get there. But there's a difference between a seal and a mark, isn't there? You see, a seal means something is closed up, it's guaranteed, and a mark is simply a mark. So Satan always comes up with a counterfeit, but it's never quite as good as the original. So these 144,000 are sealed. Now remember, this is a symbolic number. Now to John's question, who can stand? Only those branded with the Lamb's seal of ownership. You see. That would be you and that would be me, providing you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Because the moment you do that, you're sealed. And again, we refer to, you know, Jesus, John uh, 6, 39. Verse we're well acquainted with. And what does it say? It says, in this is the will of him who sent me, God, that I should lose nothing of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. So of those sealed, he will lose nothing. If you have the seal of God, you don't have to worry about whether or not you'll take the mark of the beast, because you won't. It's that simple. And it actually says that in chapter 13. When we get there, uh, we will see. Ah. Uh, Anybody know who Bobby McFerrin was? Yeah, of course Michelle knows. Michelle knows everything. If you ever have some crazy oddball trivia question, just ask Michelle. She knows. Well, Bobby Farron wrote a song in, in 1988. He made it popular. And I, I, I found out, as I, I went to YouTube to listen to it again, because it's a cool little song. It was the first a cappella song to go to number one. And, and anyway, you know, don't worry. Be happy. Yeah. It's a cool little song. That could be the Christian song. You know, don't worry, be happy. Because God is awake. He's on the job. He's got it covered. You're sealed. You're in. Now you've got some tribulation to work through, yes. But that's okay. And then finally here, let's see, we have uh, verses 9 through 14. Let's see what happens here. Now, you remember, bear in mind, now, when he looked, he saw a lamb. You remember that part? And then he looked and saw a lion. And the lamb and the lion were one and the same, right? Just from a different perspective. 
Okay, we have some of the same stuff going on here. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to our God forever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I would submit to you that the 144,000 and the great unnumberable multitude are one and the same viewed from a different perspective. The first, I would say, is what we call the church militant. The second, the church triumphant. And the difference is the church militant is the church on earth. The church triumphant is the church in heaven. You see? And that's a good term because here we are we're struggling we're fighting all these battles so we have to be a little militant about it but once we get to heaven we're triumphant and notice they wash their robes in the blood of the lamb that's how they got in by the lamb the same way we'll get in and they get the white robes and what have we seen that white is representative of as we go through the book over and over it's representative of victory of conquering of overcoming so those have overcome and again you, you can look at this from two perspectives if you look from the world's perspective they didn't overcome anything they died but you look at it from a biblical perspective and they overcame and triumphed as they moved into their place in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't be thrown by this term, the Great Tribulation. Sometimes we get to reading along and say, there's tribulation, then there's the Great Tribulation. Okay, so that has to be some other event. And no. When we look back from a historical perspective, and, and some, some, there's a little disagreement. Some, some theologians want to say, well, the Great Tribulation covers the time from the fall till Christ's second coming. Others say it covers the time from his crucifixion to the second coming. Now, I wouldn't quibble over it one way or the other. But the earth has been in bad shape ever since the fall. Right? Everything. You know, Paul tells us in Romans that the whole creation groans while it waits on Jesus to come back and set things right. Because when sin entered the world, everything was turned on his head. And what was turned on his head mostly were relationships. Relationship with God was broken between Adam and Eve. So, you wonder why you can't get along with your husband or wife? You wonder why your kids act like they do? You wonder why your boss is a jerk? You wonder why whatever? It's because our relationships have all been turned on our heads. We shouldn't expect peace and harmony on the outside. We can have it on the inside, but everything else is going to be a struggle. We have to overcome. So the Great Tribulation is simply the result of the fall, and now since Christ's death on the cross, his judgment has begun being poured out on this earth. And we've seen the, the first six seals and we will see the seventh next week. So again we have here, what we have here is God promising to protect those who belong to him. And so in verse 15 we see therefore they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What are they doing in heaven? 
They're worshiping and serving God. What are we doing here? Hopefully we're worshiping and serving God. The heavenly lifestyle is one of worship and service. Why not start getting ready for it? We're going to spend eternity doing that. We may as well start practicing. Our hope is in heaven. You know, we, we've, we've, I think, really done a disservice to the gospel over the years because we, we tell people, well, if you'll, you know, you, you just need Jesus and he'll cure your addiction, he'll cure your marriage, he'll cure your financial problems. Baloney. Baloney. He will not, generally speaking. You accept Jesus, he'll take you to heaven when you die. That's what he promises us. But we presented him as a Mr. Fix-It. As a guy with a magic wand. Usually all those other problems I mentioned are, are lifestyle problems anyway. So if you change your lifestyle, you'll probably fix a lot of those problems. But maybe not. We have a, a whole book in the Bible called Job. You know, you ever read it? Pretty depressing. <laughs> You know, Job had more trouble than I hope I ever see. And he never did a thing wrong. He lives in a fallen world. And we live in a fallen world. Because the Lamb is in their midst, they have overcome. Because the Lamb is in their midst, they have overcome. You know, we saw in chapter 3 that Jesus has opened a door in heaven that no man can shut. And he tells us in the Gospel of John, he is that door. And if we go through that door, we're in. We're sealed. Salvation is secure. But here's the thing. Time is finite, and time is running out. Now, I have no idea when it's going to run out. It could run out before I finish today. And some of you may be thinking, yeah, as long as you're taken. Or it may, it may run out 2,000 years from now. I don't know. But I know it is finite. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day to do that. To make sure that you're sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do... Well, I'll wrap this up in a second with a prayer and just say in the quietness of your heart, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you to be my Lord and my Savior. And you're done. One last observation. It's interesting in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 15, when Jesus is in the garden praying, we call it the high priestly prayer, he says, I don't pray that you will take them out of the world, but that you will keep them from the evil one. So even Jesus didn't ask the Father to take us out of the problems, but he did ask him to keep us from the ultimate evil one. And of that we're assured. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for the hope of heaven. And Lord, help us to understand that and to be able to keep our eye on that. Because we have no hope in this world. Yeah, whatever we trust in can be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Whether it be our health, our finances, our good deeds, whatever it is, it, it's all so fleeting and, Lord, just so fickle. And so help us to revel in your grace, to understand that it is indeed greater than all our sin, that it cleanses us from within, and that when we die, we will step into eternity with you. What a great day that will be. The hope of heaven. And Lord, if there's anyone here who does not have that hope, I would ask that you're right now in the quietness of their heart, they would pray that prayer and simply say, Lord Jesus, I need a Savior. I can't do it. And know that it is done. Thank you now as we go to the communion table, Lord. Let us spend a few minutes with you and be reminded of that great grace that is able to cleanse from within, that is greater than all our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>